Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome again. Uh, my name is Rastislav Kacher. I'm a member of the Center for European Affairs, and it's my privilege and also a special pleasure to introduce this keynote speech and to comment on it. Because the keynote speaker is somebody who is not a, 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 a new one to me. He's an old friend. Uh, and with old friends, sometimes, you know, you got kind of a two kinds things. It's a pleasure to work with. Uh, and uh, I joined some time with uh, France in, in Washington, D.C., where he was the Belgium ambassador for a while, for five years almost. Before that, he was perm rep at NATO for Belgium, uh, having a very much a shared experience of my uh, past. And before that, uh, as the representative, permanent representative to the European Union. France joined Foreign Service in 71. You would not believe because he still uh, looks like a newcomer to the service, but he's one of the most distinguished uh, Belgium diplomats. The curse of working with him is, though, that you may learn about yourself things uh, which are hidden, uh, your hidden identities. And I was, as I was preparing to introduce you, France, I typed in, I googled uh, mine and your name together. And I learned uh, that I have a hidden identity, which I, was, which I was trying to hide, as the um, ambassador of Zimbabwe in Washington, D.C. And we are pictured beautifully together as ambassador of Zimbabwe, Rastislav Kacher, and ambassador of Belgium, Baron Frandale. So thank you for revealing this hidden identity. They never sent a check to me for that. Uh, but it's a privilege for me to introduce France, who will uh, open up with a keynote towards a genuine economic and monetary union to tell you he is one of the most qualified people to, to, to talk about that, uh, because it's, it's handwriting, his footprint uh, in the document which was prepared by the president of, of European um, um, Union are undeniable. So um, good thing is that uh, you take credit for that. Uh, bad thing, uh, if it goes well, you may be hanged. But nobody in this room might be more qualified to speak about this. Franz, uh, let me offer you the floor, and then I'll ask uh, uh, two uh, gentlemen uh, to comment, uh, please. Thank you. Well, it's uh, a great pleasure, really it is to be in Bratislava, and for two reasons. I first came here, it must have been 94, I think. I was under secretary for political affairs on a complex diplomatic mission at the time. And if I'm back here now, I see, together with you, how much has changed. And how much change in your life and in our lives uh, has been wrought by this project of the European Union, <coughs> I think. Whether we know it or not, uh, our lives would have been quite different if this European Union project had not been there. The second reason is that I must be, <coughs> I'm very thankful and I want to commend um, the uh, uh, initiators of this uh, meeting here in Bratislava for bringing the debate to places outside Brussels. Uh, myself, I'll try to, I try to travel a lot all over the uh, European Union uh, to participate in such a debates, and uh, I am always quite grateful to see that <coughs> individual countries as well invest a lot in trying to bring the debate to their public opinion. Thank you for that. What I would like to, de to do now is, first of all, say a few words about this report on uh, towards a genuine economic and monetary union. And then I would like to share with you my analysis to the, uh, about the extent to which the euro crisis and our response to it is changing a number of, uh, is changing the landscape of the whole European Union in many ways. And then I would like to conclude by saying a few words about further integration in Europe. That is something you would expect from any Belgian, I suppose. The, first of all, the report on the economic, on <coughs> taking steps towards a uh, genuine uh, economic and monetary union. In certain quarters, it has been presented as a kind of a, uh, a sinister plot 
to bring through the uh, genuine economic and monetary union uh, Europe to some kind of end stage. That, I must say, was certainly not our intention. Our intention was to bring some sense of perspective, some sense of direction and some frame to what had to be done to make the, Europe, the economic and monetary union stable, safe and sound again. And if you read the report, it corresponds very much to that aim. Uh, because basically we tried to make progress and are still trying to make progress on three fronts. There was a fourth front, democratic deficit, I'll come back to that later. First of all, a fiscal discipline, budgetary discipline. Secondly, the banking union. Um, and thirdly, economic coordination you will see that there was not really conceptually anything new. The law had said that to have a stable economic and monetary union, a stable currency, you needed more national policy coordination. They were not able to do that 15 years ago. What they did do was budgetary discipline, and what they did do was monetary discipline. So what we have, the, when we felt there was um, as a consequence of the things which happened, an important repair job to be done. First of all, fiscal discipline, budgetary discipline. Um, <clears throat> we had to, to admit when we wrote the report that most of the work had already been done, the so-called six-pack. Arose then the question whether we could do more. And very quickly it appeared to do more. You were talking about very important transfers of sovereignty from national parliaments to Brussels. Um, certain countries were uh, ready to consider that if in exchange they got uh, a huge uh, amount of solidarity or mutualization as we called it in our language. Basically, we, had, <coughs> we have seen that there, to go further beyond the six-pack, beyond the fiscal the budgetary discipline we restored, to go beyond that, uh, basically meant that we were changing the rules of the game and the political conditions at the time of negotiation were obviously and evidently not there. And that explains why the main chantier, the main uh, part of steps towards the economic, again, uh, uh, monetary and economic union was to be found in the banking union. And there, I think the report made a huge difference. We are now in this process of building this banking union. We have decided the single supervisory mechanism, which is in the process of being worked out. And as we, uh, uh, as we hear from, uh, from Frankfurt, this is a huge operation, but it is progressing, maybe not as quickly as, as some, uh, some of us would have liked, but it is a huge operation, so huge operations take time. The steps in, December, in the uh, European Council of uh, December, they took uh, decisions on how to fund recovery and resolution of banks. <coughs> this is a work in progress as well. The European Council will come back to it in June. And the third is the question of how you make sure that there is more economic um, convergence, how we increase the competitiveness of our economies. Those uh, <coughs> points were brought up in that report and led to these proposals which <coughs> are now being discussed about the so-called contractualization, which mean that recommendations on economic policy, which every year are addressed individually to countries, would, be, would become more binding and of course discussed together with that is the idea how much money you have to put to it to make this happen. So my conclusion on my first point is the report on steps towards a genuine economic and monetary union 
was and is essentially a needs-driven process. We have identified, I think, quite correctly what you need to make the euro uh, uh, and the euro area and the economic and monetary union uh, stable and sound. Work is progressing, and I think if the report is implemented, one can say that for all practical purposes, um, we have a currency which has been uh, stabilized in its fundamentals. So that was a few words of explanation about the past. And even if, I, if we said that this was a kind of a well, uh, well-defined operation, needs-driven practical nature, we have to see that the euro crisis and our response to it has been changing a number of fundamentals in the European Union. Um, and I see three of them. I see an, uh, an economic shift of land uh, landscape, I see a political shift of landscape, and I see an institutional shift of landscape. First of all, the economy. If all these disciplines I was talking about are implemented, and they are being implemented, we will have, at least in the euro area, an economy which will rely, which will be characterized in the future by steady growth, relying essentially on structural reform. And I think that if, when, if this process goes on, like I think I will, that our uh, competitiveness of our industry and our economy will increase over time in a steady, steady fashion. Uh, and at the end of this process, which socially has been painful, particularly in some countries, but at the end of this process, we will be stronger, more competitive, and more prosperous. The second uh, consequence, I would say, is about, is political. Um, <clears throat> there has been this discussion whether the euro crisis changed <clears throat> the, um, has changed the uh, Franco-German couple, which, as we all know, it has always been the backbone of the European construction. Um, I think too much has been made out of it. It's obvious that in times when it's about a common currency, that a country like Germany, where the common currency came from, is in the lead. But do not forget that in this essential couple, there are a number of equalizers. And we have seen one of the equalizers at work during the Libya crisis, where it was France, uh, together with Britain, who took the lead in the military operation after having received the green light from the European Council. And so the, I think at the end of the day, everything taken together, the, this essential couple still remains very much like it is, and uh, that balance there is <coughs> shifting according to subjects, but overall it is still there. Now, the case was maybe a bit different for Britain. I think that the Euro crisis, in a way, tipped the scales in the debate uh, about Europe uh, inside the United Kingdom, with the consequence of the decisions uh, which the, the British Prime Minister took, and which may, or may not, which may in the end lead to a negotiation and I think that if such a negotiation were to take place, that it would certainly have as a uh, byproduct the fact that the euro area would become more autonomous in its decision making and less dependent on countries which are not uh, a member of it. <clears throat> so there you see that the Euro crisis and our response to it has brought about a political shift which will be with us for many years to come, I think. Thirdly, institutionally. Um, institutionally, there are, I think, two, uh, two
two shifts of paradigm, if I may say so. First of all, we have had this discussion and we alluded to it in this report on the Economic and Monetary Union on the democratic deficit. And it's a, a subject into which we should delve a bit deeper. I don't think you can make the point that there is technically a democratic deficit. After all, members of European Parliament have been uh, elected by popular vote. Uh, the Commission uh, is designated between the European Council with democratically elected prime ministers and, uh, and a democratically elected parliament. So technically you cannot say that the European uh, Union has, no, has not, uh, um, has, uh, is not uh, run in a democratic fashion. But I think the sentence or the phrase or the expression is often used to say, uh, to say something else that the European institutions just do not have enough credibility and legitimacy all over the Union. Now, <laughs> faisons la part des choses, uh, many national institutions have a problem of credibility with their own public opinions as well, as we all know in our own home countries. But I think in the case of European institutions, it's a bit, bit more than that. And there, uh, <clears throat> I'm your blue-stocking federalist again. I think the level of credibility and legitimacy of our institutions will only increase uh, pari passu with further integration of the European Union. Uh, it's a long discussion, a long debate, but I want to leave, uh, <laughs> leave that idea, that uh, uh, principle uh, with you. So, on the institutional field, there is another question which uh, is very much uh, in the center of the debate, whether the euro area is going to become more independent, more autonomous, is going to become the uh, very center of European integration. Two remarks there. First of all, it's not 17 versus 27 or 28 now because after a transitional period, most of the countries who are not in the, in the euro yet will be, uh, become a member of the common currency. And in the past three years, we have done everything we could to make sure that these countries were, uh, were involved in whatever we were doing, and I think they have been uh, grateful for that. Um, so, <clears throat> And I think that maybe as a consequence of a, of a negotiation which we are maybe going to have, we will have an, a euro area with more legislative and political autonomy. And the only footnote I would like to leave with you there is make sure that when this happens, that the role of the institutions in such a setup is not lessened, is not reduced, is not limited vis-a-vis -vis we have now. Uh, having uh, represented uh, my own country for so many years in matters European, uh, I know, as you know from experience, how important the institutional setup is for smaller and medium-sized countries. So that would be my footnote. Now to conclude, so the European Union is changing, spots. Are we sitting pretty? Can we just leave matters as it is? And there I'll, uh, <coughs> my answer is a, a European integrationist's answer. No, we cannot stay where we are. Why not? I'll give you a couple of examples. First example is the example of California. If California goes broke, that does not endanger the dollar. Why is that? Because the United States is so much more integrated than we are. So if we want to have a strong currency over time, you cannot have a strong currency if the rest of the project is not further integrated. 
You cannot have a strong currency if you have weaknesses elsewhere. Other example. We, uh, you know and I know that we live in a highly volatile, highly dangerous, highly complex, unstable neighborhood. Look to the south, look to the east. Um, we have many good reasons to try and make sure that our foreign policy operation and our defense operation becomes more integrated because we will need some, someday, somewhere in the future, we will need for strength. It is a reason why the President of the European Council uh, <clears throat> has brought the subject of defense to the level of the heads of state and government to serve as a reminder that, it's, that there again there is really a weakness which we must address, otherwise it risks catching up with us. So that is a bit my analysis on where we are and where we are going. And if I may leave you with one lesson of 41 years of foreign service, in the European Union, every crisis ends with more Europe, never with less Europe. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Franz, for, for great uh, opening comments and, uh, and very interesting keynote. I'm sure that uh, both gentlemen have a lot of fuel uh, now for, for comments. And uh, without any um, further ado, let me introduce the first one to comment is Mr. Harald Weiglein, who is the Director General uh, for Economic Policy and Financial Markets Departments uh, in the Federal Ministry of Finance in Austria. Uh, he's got interesting. Uh, bit in his past. He was journalist years ago, so and I smiled because as I work for government, now I'm on the other side as an NGO. Uh, he flipped the coin and uh, he come from one bank to another, which is an interesting experience, but I think he did a very well transition. So um, uh, let me turn to uh, your comments and then we'll come to the second commentator, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the key sentence uh, in your presentation, Franz, was shall we leave matters as they are or uh, shall we proceed? I also think we cannot stay where we are, but the question is how far we want to go and how far we will go. Um, this panel is titled Towards a Genuine Economic and Monetary Union, and perhaps it's worth recapitulating. You have to ask yourself, what makes a genuine economic and monetary union? I mean, there are, the easy answer is there are the five criteria. You need economic integration. You need uh, flexibility in order to be able to deal with asymmetric shocks. Flexibility meaning labor mobility, capital mobility, but also, which is sometimes forgotten, flexibility of wages and prices. You need some capacity for fiscal transfers to address imbalances. You need anathema to some, perhaps uh, uh, joint liability for debt, and you need a lender of the last resort. Now, a couple of years ago, you might have asked how many of these criteria our common currency actually fulfills. I think the answer now is a bit different than a couple of years ago. Uh, we, could also, we could argue that some of the things are there, not all of them, of course. But before we answer the technical questions, which, which things we want to put in place, I think we have to ask the political question, do our popula populations, do the people of Europe want us to go down that path? I mean, ask the Germans how popular the concept of uh, joint liability is or ask the French how fond they are of flexible wages. Uh, I think we, are, we at the political level are way ahead of our populations. And I have no answer how to bridge that gap, but we have to always keep that in mind uh, with what we're doing. Um, we try to address the flaws in uh, the project of the common currency. But, as I just said, we don't do it because there is widespread, broad political will or an urge on behalf of the populations to enter a 
genuine economic and monetary union. We do it because there is a crisis and we have to find solutions. And that is our motivation. And that explains rather a lot where we are. Sometimes people think we fudge, sometimes people think we don't go the, the whole way. But that's just because our motivation is to find answers, solutions to the crisis. Our motivation is not to pursue lofty ideas where we don't see the added value. And I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, we have actually uh, achieved rather a lot in a fight against the crisis. And I have to repeat something Jörg Asmussen said yesterday. There is a debate, austerity versus growth. And he said yesterday, this debate is more than mistaken. And I mean, I can say from the bottom of my heart, I fully agree. This, this thing is not a debate, austerity versus growth. And why is it not? Uh, for, the, for the danger of sounding like a broken record or telling you things you may already know, but this is not one crisis. This is three crises in one. We have a growth crisis, no doubt, but we also have a debt crisis and we also have a banking crisis. And if we concentrate too much on one element, like for instance, put all our resources into growth, then the other two elements will deteriorate. And it's likewise with the other two elements. So there are no simple, singular answers here. We have to pursue a, an integrated, multi-pronged strategy, address all the three causes at once. I mean, it sounds banal, but it's the best solution I can come up with. And this is actually what we're doing. Uh, we're addressing the debt item with the six-pack and the two-pack. And we're, we're even creating backstops not really lenders of the last resort, but in a way, actually, they are, like the EFSF or the ESM or even uh, the OMT by uh, the European Central Bank. We're addressing the growth problem in the framework of the European semester. We have quite a number of new in instruments, like the macro imbalance procedure. Uh, we have uh, the Euro Plus Pact, which deals a whole lot with questions of competitiveness. So the instruments are there. We, we even have a lot of growth elements in all the programs for the program countries. The problem with those is that uh, uh, these are mostly structural reforms meant to enhance growth, but they're politically difficult, and these are the parts of the programs where most of the slippages occur. So it's not that we are stupid and concentrate only on austerity, but the things that actually enhance growth, the structural reforms, are politically difficult and are sometimes not implemented. Uh, we address the banking problem by way of forging a banking union. We're making progress here. We're working on important instruments. At the moment, we're working on an instrument for direct recapitalization, which, in a way, is also a neat way of mutualizing debt, a way that is uh, that conforms with the treaty, because uh, banks are private institutions. So I think we've come rather a long way. Uh, but what else is on the table? And here I, um, I must say openly that I'm a bit more skeptical. Uh, we have on the table a fiscal capacity, con the idea of contractual, contractual arrangements, or as it's sometimes called, a competitiveness and convergence instrument. Um, I understand the economic impetus behind it, you know, fiscal transfer, address imbalances, but I just don't see what it's for and I don't see the incentive. Um, actually, if a country conducts structural reforms, it will increase wealth. It will be good for the country and good for the people. So it should be an end in itself. And now the idea seems to me to be to pay governments or pay countries money for doing things that will benefit them anyway. And I have a slight problem with that because I don't think it makes sense. And I find it funny to talk about the fiscal capacity without knowing in what areas we will actually 
need it for? Will we need it for labor markets? Will we need it for the social? I don't know. But it's funny to talk about a fiscal resource without knowing what it's ultimately going to be for. Um, and then there's the legal question. I mean, obviously, it would be a good idea to integrate it into the European semester. But are we going to make it legally binding? Then I see another problem with our parliament, because uh, here I speak from experience. It was difficult to set up instruments outside the treaty like the ESM on a national level, because parliamentarians stand up and say, we want to have a say in this. This is about a lot of money. And uh, I spend a lot of time in the EU Standing Committee, and now I also spend a lot of time in the ESM Parliamentary SAP Committee. And in uh, a couple of months, I'll spend even more time in the ESM Parliamentary SAP Committee on uh, secondary market purchases. And I have uh, little ambition to spend even more time in a Parliamentary <laughs> Subcommittee on contractual arrangements. So perhaps that's my personal problem, but it also plays a role. Um, then the even loftier concepts, uh, Eurobonds. I mean, again, I understand the economic idea behind it, the mutualization of debt. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to refer all the counter arguments, just one neat legal argument where I haven't heard a good answer yet. And that is uh, the question of negative pledge clauses. We have, I think it's around 9,000 billion uh, euros of bonds out there somewhere for the Eurozone. And most of these have negative pledge clauses. And if we were now to create something new by law with a, a joint and several guarantee, that would infringe on the rights of our creditors. And it would give them the possibility to make lawsuits in, I don't know, a number of jurisdictions. At the moment, we were to implement something like that. And it might even trigger cross-default clauses, which is to say they could demand their money back right away. So how do we deal with that? Either we say we wait until all these bonds mature. But then the Eurobond will be not a long-term project, but a very long-term project, because we might have to wait 30 years. It's perhaps not the next crisis, but the crisis after the next crisis. Perhaps we have to do some expectations management here, not create unrealistic expectations uh, about instruments that may be neat in theory and may, may work in economic models, but not in the legal framework we have here. There are just too many open questions. A bit the same, feel a bit the same with euro bills, but there is the additional argument that even during the crisis, the short end of the market worked rather well. Why would we want to intervene there? I don't see the point. Uh, redemption fund, similar. It also foresees a joint and several guarantees, so we would perhaps run into the same problem. But I'm just saying this for, being, for, for providing a counterpoint. I mean, maybe there are good arguments. But this is the way we feel in Austria, and I think it, these are fair points and should be discussed. Um, right, if all the ideal I'm, I'm brushing away all the ideal solutions for the long time. I'm aware of that. So I, I don't want to dodge the question what my approach is or what our approach is. Again. I think we're doing fine. We should concentrate on the things we can do on the basis of the treaty and should really, really try to implement those and stick to what we said, put our money where our mouth is. But there's a level above that. We did not enter into this crisis for lack of rules. We always had rules concerning debt deficits and all that question is, do we want to live these rules? And that's a political question again. Uh, just one example. There is talk that some big European country is not going to reach its, deficits target, its deficit targets this year. And there is talk that we should prolong the excessive deficit procedure. There might be 
good macroeconomic arguments, but I think it would be hugely detrimental for our credibility. I really think so. I mean, we created the first compact that everybody signed, which is not even in force yet. And <laughs> before we come to the actual implementation, we're all, we're, we, we run the danger of being perceived as being lax again. And I think the whole question of laxness didn't start with Greece, it started with Germany and France many years back. Um, so, and yeah, on the political level, there's another question that I sometimes ask myself, and I've, I've seen many discussions when uh, we talk about directives and certain instruments we want to create, and there's always a conflict. The conflict behind all our discussions, or many of our discussions, is that we truly have not found a joint common vision for what Europe is going to be, or should be. We have two camps. On the one hand, we have people who see a strong role for the state, who think uh, markets are inherently something dangerous and we should protect our people from markets, from, from too much market, perhaps. Too much competition is also suspicious or should go hand in hand with enhanced protection. On the other hand, we have a camp uh, who think, uh, who believe in individual responsibility, in unleashing entrepreneurial spirits, who believe in more freedom and less interference from the state. And if we could perhaps, I mean, we can't overcome the difference, but if we could reconcile these two camps into one European idea, maybe we would need less rules because most of the time we might be doing the sensible thing anyway. That would be the best option, uh, but I don't think it will come along in my lifetime. So we might just as well pursue the second best option which is the rules-based approach we've been doing for the last couple of months and years. And don't get me wrong, second best is actually quite good. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was a very interesting ball played back, France. Though, you know, when I would look at common vision, I, I would start that you, you wouldn't find common vision, not in this room, not in this country, and, uh, and never uh, in Europe. And it was always those who would want a strong government and strong hand and those who would want an open mind. So, and this is, I find, not a curse. This I find as a blessing and a kind of an engine of political evolution at the end. But uh, it was a couple of very good points. But let me turn to the second commentator uh, for the panel, uh, permanent under uh, secretary at the Ministry of Finance of the Republic of Finland, uh, Finland Mr. Marty Hetemäki. Uh, who's been uh, in this business for so many years and now being uh, almost chief economist for the Finland and representing uh, Finland in all of the crucial debates uh, on the future of uh, European Union. So um, I'm looking forward for your comments, Mr. Hetzmaki, please. Thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, conference. I think the issues that are on the agenda uh, will be those issues that uh, and, and the way those issues will, will be addressed uh, and, 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 and uh, developed and solved will save the European project uh, in, in a very critical way for the years to come. And it's, a, of course, a great honor and, and, and pleasure to, to comment on, on Franz von Dahle's uh, intervention. Uh, for those who do not know, I mean, the great leaps that have been taken in the European Union and the Euro area in the past two, three years uh, have been very much sort of the work of France and uh, his colleagues. France is the sort of thinker and mediator uh, behind the scenes who makes everything sort of possible. And, and much has been achieved, and this has been a great leap forward uh, for the Euro area and the Union as a whole, what has been uh, accomplished uh, in a very short uh, uh, time period. Now, the analysis that 
France presented, I, I fully agree with. I mean, you describe it very well. I mean, the political, institutional uh, setting and, and tensions. Um, and and um, I just was sort of thinking to comment on possibly just one or two key concepts that you mentioned. And uh, one was this democratic uh, deficit. And you said that um, Pari Passu with the democratic, to add, while addressing the democratic deficit, we need to move further in European integration. We need to have more Europe. Uh, otherwise, we cannot address the democratic deficit. I, I fully agree on that. And I was wondering, what are the sort of practical steps to do that? And um, you referred to the new contracts on economic reforms, and also Harold referred to them. And, and what I have been thinking is that um, what is sort of one fundamental problem uh, in the business of European Union, and especially in the Euro area, and that is something that I would call the Brussels syndrome of domestic policy making. And, and with that, I, I, I mean, um, when I observe the political debates in my country and in the other countries of, of the Euro area, I, I often get the sort of crude perception that um, in the parliament, when the politicians uh, present the case, it seems to be the case that all the good decisions are taken by the domestic parliaments. And the bad decisions <laughs> come from Brussels. There is this lack of ownership of the commonly taken decisions. And uh, when you have this practice for a long time, and France referred to, to the UK, you sort of increase the gulf between what is called the European policies and the sort of national sentiment. And at some point in time, this gulf becomes too big, and one may end up with calls for referendum and so on. So what to do with this? And, and, and I, I think, in fact, something has been done already. And um, uh, in the fiscal compact, what was done was to translate the European rules into national rules. And the sort of deficit rule, the budget rule, was adapted into national le legislation. And governments in the Euro area are now accountable for following those European rules directly to the national parliaments. It's national legislation that imposes the obligation to governments. Now, when we come to these contracts, I, I, I think, like Franz was saying, that so far the recommendations from the European level have been recommendations. They have not been binding. And uh, we have had years and years of economic policy coordination of Lisbon strategy, EU 2020, European semester. And this has become a sort of a routine mantra. All the good things have been repeated, but they have not been followed through by way of implementation. And now, with these new contracts, and the idea has been that governments would take these contracts, make these contracts with the Commission, but then they would be accountable to the national parliaments, where these decisions on structural reforms are finally taken. And I think rightly so, because uh, what we are talking about now are very sensitive issues like, I don't know, pension reforms, 
wage indexation, uh, public sector reforms, and there has to be this national ownership, otherwise we are lost. We don't have the people with us and we don't have the implementation. I, I, I think this is something, uh, and, and uh, this may be one way, one path which we have to follow. And I think at the same time, this is more Europe. I mean, this is not detaching from the European policies, but sort of internalizing what is commonly agreed at the national level. Then finally, I, I was thinking uh, when Franz mentioned institutions and California and, and what could sort of derail the, what could re ruin sort of the European project. And, and uh, the EU and also the Euro area is a sort of special uh, setting and it's a setting that is based on rules and on strong institutions that look after that the rules are respected. These are the sort of key elements and, and uh, if the rules that have been commonly agreed will not be followed and implemented, I think we run the risk that again, the, as Franz was referring to, that there's a question about the credibility of the institutions and at the same time, a credibility of what is commonly being done. And, and um, this, if there's a breach of rules, there may be a sense of unfair, unequal treatment and so on. And, and again, we would have a big problem then uh, uh, in terms of ownership of European policies. A second thing, and this came to my mind from California, and, and the sort of uh, comparison to the US Monetary Union. And very important in the US Monetary in Union has been the sort of uh, responsibility of the individual states for their policies. California was and is still in big troubles in economic terms. And uh, last year, they had a referendum on tax increases, and they overwhelmingly approved the tax increases. There was no question of asking the federal government for help. And why is this? And, and the beginning of the US Monetary and Economic Union was not a successful one. They had in the beginning bailouts, defaults of states. And this all changed in as long back as 1840s. Then eight states and then territory of Florida defaulted. And there had been many defaults before, many bailouts before. And the Congress debated at the time um, what to do. And there were proponents of uh, bailouts saying that there are important negative spillover effects to other states that have not defaulted if we let these states default. And there was also the point made about solidarity. We cannot let those states default. Uh, it would uh, be detrimental for national unity in the US. But finally, there were those uh, in the Congress who said that if we now bail out these states, this will lead to future deficits, future debts, and future bailouts. So we are in this sort of, sort of vicious circle of bailouts. And at, at the end, the Congress said no to these bailouts. This was in 1814. And since then, there has been no defaults of US states. They have learned to live with these sort of hard budget constraints, and market discipline is something that is also very strong in the US. 
this sort of combination, in fact, what happened following the 1840s was that uh, uh, the US states adopted in state legislation these balanced budget amendments, something very similar to what we have now with the fiscal compact. Of the 50 states, 49 have these balanced bud budget uh, rules in state legislation. Only the state of Vermont does not have one. In fact, by the way, our rule is much more intelligent than the one that they have in the US. We have it in structural terms. It takes care of the cycles and uh, allows for sort of uh, sensible fiscal policies. But the point is this, that uh, there has been ownership to these rules. This ownership has been enforced by market discipline. There's no question that there would be lack of solidarity among the US states, although the federal government is not helping California when it's in trouble. There are many arguments in the US and the political debate is highly divided, polarized in the US, but the polarization does not go or is not dividing states, it's, it's di dividing political uh, uh, parties. And uh, I, I think it would be very harmful for the euro area to go the other way and create a monetary union with greater and debtor states. We know that in the long run, if somebody owes you, that there's a saying which goes something like this, that uh, uh, if you lend money to a friend, you lose both. <laughs> and uh, I can foresee that if we would be accumulating debts and credits among the euro area member states, uh, we would create a lot of unhappiness in the debtor states, which are forced to follow very strict uh, policies that are seen to be imposed by the creditor states, and they pay high interest burdens. And then also the creditor states who subsidize the debtor states, there would be a, possibly a lot of unhappiness among the population if the creditor, the debtor states will not follow these um, um, agreed policies. I, I just, one, one example that came to my mind, we are facing some important elections in a very short term. What if there would be an outcome where a government that would be opposed to what has been commonly agreed and would embark on policies that what would not be prudent what would we do? Would we sort of overrule the election result? I mean, it, it, it is very hard to see that one could impose on a country something that its population does not accept. And, 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 and therefore this brings to me sort of the big conclusion that uh, more Europe addressing the democratic deficit will require full national ownership of the common European policies. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sure that there will be a million temptations uh, react spontaneously and immediately. And I was caught in particular by the, those two things. How, how you square that circle uh, that you want to be re-elected uh, and also run structural reforms 
which on short terms are not sexy at all, but on medium and long run are, are absolutely necessary uh, to do. And, uh, and this legitimacy issue, uh, you know, this is kind of an, hen an egg debate, what should be done first. Uh, whether what people would wish or the country needs, and you know that country needs that, and you would try to drag people behind that vision. And I think if you made uh, a, a public opinion polling in the early 50s, whether the European Union concept was kind of desired by people, uh, we might be disappointed that uh, might be not. So, opinion uh, polls did not exist at that, the, time. at that time. And we got caught in the permanent opinion polling, so we don't see that much of a leadership uh, but uh, rather, you know, policy shaped by morning opinion polls. But it's easy for us to say because none of us at the panel run for election and re-election. So um, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to be critical on that. This is just a note. But before you comment, uh, I think I'll take that privilege that at least two questions from, from the floor. And please, questions, not a lengthy comments. Keep those comments for the coffee break. Uh, if there are two qu quick questions, I'll take those and I'll let the panel to comment uh, on, on each other. There is one hand over there, please. Quick question. My name is Ivan Kuhn. I'm a political analyst from Conservative Institute, Slovakia. Uh, from the presentation, the keynote, but also from the uh, debate uh, last night, it uh, looks like uh, there are only two options. Uh, maintain the current state or uh, go with further integration. So I have a question for all uh, panelists. Uh, they, they do not uh, um, take into consideration a possibility of the uh, third way, <laughs> if I may say, um, to go step backwards, to make a sort of disintegration uh, of things which do not work. Thanks. Thank you. The second question, yeah, behind, please. <clears throat> Milan Izovica, Mesat and Bratislava. Congratulations to the panelists and thanks for the great start of the debate for today. There was a lot of arguments uh, which serve as a good basis for a discussion and especially in uh, the opening remarks on uh, Ambassador Van Dalen, I, I caught one argument which uh, uh, I think is very worthy mentioning once again and that was that in the Eurozone we will have a constant, our economies will have a constant growth relying on structural reforms. And I see two problems with that. Uh, uh, first, probably uh, they would be in the economy. When we look into the mirror of uh, uh, our growth, we might be very close, uh, now at least, uh, because the growth is either minimal or non-existent. But our economies differ uh, in their performance. Some of them are the better performing, some of them are worse performing. So there are different instruments that are needed to address those economic problems. And second problems are political problems. Uh, in the EU we have uh, different election cycles, elections are on different dates. Uh, the result of these elections are either the governments of the center-left or either the governments of the center-right. Some of them are more committed to the, uh, doing reforms, uh, structural reforms. Some of them are more hesitant in spending their political capital, especially at the time when they are facing uh, elections. So how are we going to bridge that? How to tame 27 tigers uh, at different places and at different times? That's an interesting question. Gentlemen, I think there is a lot of fuel for one more hour of discussion, but I'm afraid we do not have that. We might have that uh, up to 10 minutes, not more. So uh, let us be disciplined uh, and try to take the uh, challenge. Uh, the, the first point, uh, the alternative of going back is not a real alternative, would uh, make a, a multiplication of uh, uncertainties and even the most tepid lukewarm governments would not dare going back on European integration because it's so fraught with uncertainty. It's always, uh, we talked yesterday about the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Going back is about unknown unknowns. Mm. Uh, staying where we are and sitting pretty, I gave you a couple of arguments why I don't think that is going to work because uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it's like the, uh, the old saying, staying put is going backwards. So I think the only way is forward. Um, then the second point, 
uh, I was talking about a, a future of steady growth because uh, in the hypothesis that now in the future uh, governments uh, are going to follow the rule book. Uh, if they do not, punishment will be harsh. Punishment economically from the markets. If they do not follow that rule book, you will have people, young people, moving from one country for a better future in another country. So I think there is a good reason why uh, democratically elected governments, uh, and I know there are margins and you can play a bit time, in it, but essentially there is a huge incentive for them to play by the rules because sanctions and punishment will be quite strong if they do not. This was extremely disciplined, Franz. Uh, please, gentlemen, in the same order, let's go. Um, first question concerning going one step back. Uh, I absolutely agree. I don't think this can be an alternative. It would be like trying to unmake a cake that has already been baked. It's impossible. Or it would be... Uh, yeah, hugely costly, like the breakup of a celebrity marriage. I mean, you can argue whether they should have married at all, but perhaps the, the better way is try to, to make amends and look for the way forward. Um, second question is more complicated. Constant growth relying on structural reforms and how to get re-elected. I've spent quite some time in, in political cabinets and I've often wondered whether their strategy is not completely wrong. Because the usual way of going about in, in the political cycle is you look at the approval rates, uh, you look at opinion polls, see how people react to certain types of questions, and then more often than not, your political position is shaped by opinion polls. And yet, surprise, your approval, rates, your approval rates go down. So why is that? My suspicion is that people are yearning for somebody to give them the straight talk, say something they actually believe in. And structural reforms would be something you could actually believe in. It just needs to be explained in the right way, and people are sick of being lied to. So, I mean, maybe I'm naive. I'm not a politician, after all. I hope I never have to be one. Uh, but maybe, maybe that would be a solution. It's worth a try. I like that solution now. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Marty. Yes, on, on the first, going backward, backwards, uh, there has been this old metaphor that the EU is a bicycle, that if you don't go forward, you sort of fall. I was wondering what happens if you try to go backwards with a bicycle. And, 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 and I, I, I fully agree with Franz that, uh, I mean, uh, the only way is the way to go forward. I mean, this is demanded by the international environment where we live, I mean, globalization. Uh, but then the second question on how to get the sort of political backing for the necessary reforms. I think one key thing is that, and this is in line what I said earlier, that don't say that Brussels dem demands these reforms argue why it is for your own good to take all these necessary reforms. Don't put the blame on Brussels. Uh, this is the first thing, and, and I agree with Harald that, uh, I mean, straight talk, and people are not stupid. They understand the change environment, the need for change, and the need for reform. Well, gentlemen, I think this was one of the most exciting panel I ever chaired, and I would like to thank you on my behalf as a chairman, but also on behalf of everybody in the audience, and I'll ask the audience for the round of applause for this excellent exchange that we had here. <laughs>